you'll sing tonight. I love it, I love it, I love it. And Yael, I'm guessing, will join us soon, is that the shame? And of course, my mother watches every week. So, Shalom Aleichem to my mother, who will be watching in the future. There was a guy who has since passed away, but he used to watch the class always, like, a few days later. And there's Katie, and they'd say, I'm in the future. <laughs> now he said, oh, I'm up. The Chaim, everyone. Okay, so we see I got a big pile of books here. We got this one here. We got these here. We got a story because we're finishing. There's not the shame. Torah Hey, which you've been learning for like uh, three months or something. And moving on to Chaf Dalid 24. We're going to start learning that. And they, they're a bit connected um, for Arye and anyone else who's been here through all of the previous lessons. You'll see the connection. When we start, there's at the So to conclude, so last week, of course, we had a little uh, uh, ship sink with we, with Rabbi Barbar Khanna, the deep secrets, which I was not able for some reason to talk about, even though in my head it seemed like it made a lot of sense to me. So we're going to read just the last section of Torah. Hey. Now he's going to explain that all of the, the great concepts that we understood in this Torah are hinted at in the opening verse. He's also going to explain the verses that follow. So this is from which we sing Friday night. In Kabbalah Shabbat, Becha ha 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 totot, Beko wa 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 shofa, Ha ha yu lefne a melech ha ha shem, Yiram a yam u melo, Teven le yashreva, Ne ha 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 rot, Him ha u haf, and then of course everybody has to clap, they go, Him ha u haf, Yahadarim, Yiram a hinu. That's where he stops. Okay, so now he's going to say all of this. He's going to bring the whole lesson together through that. This is the meaning of with the trumpets and the blasting of the shofar. And the chule is what we just read. And he's going to break it down. So I won't translate that whole verse now because we're going to get it in pieces here. That is through the sound of your voice that's coming out. The sound of your voice is coming out when you're davening. Of course, this is... Uh, I, know, I know you weren't here for the whole lesson, so what he's saying is that you create thunder from your davening. You, you use a voice that's so strong and powerful that it knocks your brain and straightens out the crookedness in your heart so that you're able to daven to Hashem and to do the mitzvot with joy. And he says, so what is that? That's the sound of the shofar. 
בכוח בשעת התפילה, וכן על ידי כל השופר שתוקים בראש השנה, and also through the sound of the shofar that we blow in ראש השנה, שקולות אלו הם בחינת גבורות היוצאים מעט יראי שמיים, that the sounds of the shofar are the gvurot, which are like the, the strong blast, but gvura is stringency and self-discipline and strictness that come out from a person that's playing the shofar that has an awe of heaven. Shayira hi memidat gvura, that of course awe or fear comes from the side of gvura, which is we have gvura and chesed, the two opposites. So gvura is the toughness and chesed is the kindness. Kanal is mentioned above. ובתפילה בראש השנה עומדים לפני המלך השם. And in the, the davening of Rosh Hashanah, we stand before the king Hashem. על ידי זה ירעם הים. Through this, through this will be, ירעם is to um, make like thunder, הים, in the sea. וכולי, המוח שנקרא ים, the mind is called the sea. ים חוכמה, as we mentioned in in Ot Dalet, so the mind is considered like a sea of knowledge. Shasham na'aseh b'chinat ra'amim, that's where the thunder happens in a person's mind. B'chinat kol ra'amcha b'galgal. The sound of your thunder is in the galgal, which is the, which would be a circle, but which we're talking about the head, the gilgolet. Shalom to Carlos, shalom aleichem. Hakol Shaba Meyira, where does this sound come from? It comes from a place of Yira, which on the one hand is fear, but on the other hand is awe. Awe, as I think, is a better way of translating Yira. Maka begangang demoach venasim sham ra'amim. It hits the mind, it hits the, the brain, and makes thunder, uh, like a shaking in a person's mind. Varam hanase bemoach, and this thunder that's created in a person's mind. Morid nozlim me'amoch brings down some type of liquid or some something's coming down from the brain. And it straightens out the crookedness of a person's heart. And we know where the crookedness comes from. It comes from chokhmot chitzoniot. Ah, mimi, shalom aleichem. Comes from chokhmot chitzoniot, which is secular knowledge. Now it doesn't mean that you shouldn't, you can't learn secular knowledge. It means that don't let secular knowledge make decisions for you in your faith of Hashem. So if a person, God forbid, gets sick, and the doctors say, "Sorry, you're hopeless. There's nothing you can do." And the person says, "That's it. I'm, I'm going to die. There's nothing to be done." That's chokhmot chitzoniot. That's just following what the doctors are saying. But what about Hashem? Hashem is running the world. Hashem is what gives. Uh, nature, the ability to heal, right? We have the asavim, we have grass, and we have all kinds of herbs, and we have all kinds of things. That, that's where every medication comes from nature. So how did people come up with uh, aspirin? They went to the native people around the world, and they said, what do you use for this, and what do you use for that? And they said, we use this plant. And this plant tells when a person's in pain. So they took the plant, they broke it down, they found the chemical that does it, they replicated the chemical, and now that's what we take in a pill or combinations of chemicals. But that's how they did it. All of this is ultimately coming from nature. Everything that anyone is building with is coming from nature and also what the doctors are doing. So if a person forgets that, it creates a crookedness in their heart. Same thing with finances, with having children, with getting married, with whatever it is in your life. If you forget that Hashem is running the world, it creates this crookedness. And how do you straighten it out? Through davening, with this thunderous davening that straightens it, that brings down the nozlim, the liquid, the drops from the brain into the heart and straightens out the crookedness of the heart. And this is the universe and all of those surrounding it, or all of those that are neighbors to it. Da ze. This is the connected to liba ve okin. The heart and the arteries. Deliba halev ve'okim. There's the heart and the arteries. Teven romez alalev. When it says teven v'yoshviva, it's talking about the heart. V'yoshviva romez alaokim shen halev. And the those surrounding it is talking about the arteries coming into the heart. Shirashehem mechubarim v'yoshvim v'lev atzmo. That we know we know what a heart looks like. 
We know that it has the arteries coming directly into the heart. V'yelamed, and now he's going to teach, She'al yedei yishrut halei, by straightening up the heart, Amitya shrim, kol ha'ivarim, kulam straightens up all of the limbs in the body, she'hei mechubarim lelev derech okei halev, that they are attached to the body through the arteries that are attached to the heart. V'aram meyasher et halev, k'mo she'amru, lo nivru ramim v'chulei, and this thunder that you're creating through your davening straightens out your heart. Like it said, like Rabbi Nachman likes to bring text proofs to prove his point. So he's saying from Sefer, from Masechet Bachot, there were no thunders created. Why was thunder created in the world? In order to straighten out our hearts. We gave an example way back in the beginning of the lesson. If a person is standing on the street and a Mack truck flies by, and comes this close to them, and they didn't realize it, they're like, wow, my life was saved, and it's a miracle. If they have like this thunder in their heart, and they feel it. So he says, you can do the same thing through your davening, and that will straighten out your path of serving Hashem. Ki tevel otiot, so now he's saying that the word tevel, otiot, the, word, the letters are tav, lev. Tav is lashon rishima. Tav, meaning the first letter, is connected to rishima which is uh, Roshem, which is an impression, Kamosh Katuv. Okay, so now he's going very deep into the, de- in the text proof here, that he's saying that the davening is going to straighten out your heart, and that's the reason that thunder was created in the world, to kind of wake you up. And through this, the rivers will, will clap their hands. This is connected to joy. Kanal is mentioned above. Shizuchim la. How does, how does a person truly reach a place of joy? Right? A person can get drunk and they think they're happy. But imagine a person is happy without getting drunk. And imagine a person is happy from doing a mitzvah. It's, and they're the level of joy even higher than any drunkness they've ever reached. That's true joy. So he says, how do you reach this place? You have to have a straightened out heart. Which means that you're really connected to Hashem on such a deep level. that when you do the mitzvah, you are almost swimming in a mikvah of the mitzvah. It's like that's all you feel, and that's all you know, and that's all you want to be. You know, sometimes um, when you go to the mikvah, especially if it's a warm mikvah and it's clean, you go under, you don't want to come back up. It's like, wow, it feels like the, I'm back in the womb. And, and that's, the, that's the best place to daven also, by the way. I mean, obviously you can't speak under the mikvah, but you can think. There's no sitra acha. In, when you're under the water of the mikveh, so it's a, it's a time to daven for, for people, and for, especially for people that are sick or people that need things in a, in a serious way. So imagine you're in that place, you're like in the mikveh of doing mitzvot. Kiev shali smach ela balev yashar. You can't truly be happy unless you have a straightened out heart. Tektiv, as it's written, the Yishei lev simcha says in Tehidim that those that have a straightened out heart, Ah, simcha, a joyous kemivuahulayim, as is mentioned above, a kavana on simchat mitzvah. And of course, we're not just talking about happiness for no reason. We're talking about happiness for doing a mitzvah. Sheyuchala asot at mitzvot mitzvot kol kach v'simcha that a person can do the mitzvahs with such great joy. Shelo yirtzeh shum dvar besach besachran that a person won't want any reward for doing them. El arach yitached. But the person just be totally in, in and connected to the joy of doing the mitzvah. And that is the closest that we can get to a full conscious unification with Hashem. When we're doing a mitzvah and we're not distracted by anything else, we're not expecting a reward for anything and we're feeling the joy of the mitzvah, that's when we reach the, the highest connection that we can possibly have with Hashem, I guess, until like the second we're going to die. Yeah. Probably the second that we're born. But that we don't remember. The second that we're going to die, you know, Rabbi Nachman has, it's really Rabbi Nassan brought something in Sichot Aram that we talked about in the past, where he says that the only time a person really has clarity, clarity in their thinking is the moment they die. And then they, they look, and I, I don't know how he knows this. I mean, obviously, Rabbi Nachman is dead, but he didn't tell us that at that moment. 
I guess, you know, like with his holy vision. He's like, that can only, that's the only moment that somebody knows. But if you think about it, if you've ever seen somebody there, there I've known people that really were dying and, and dying for many months. And you see something really changed on them. Like, where they really realize, like all the treatments, all the surgery, everything is over. There's nothing more to be done. They are not in this world like we are because they don't care about the electric bill and they don't care about the cavity. Like if they have to pull the tooth, they're not going to need it. And they don't care about anything. They're just in it. They're like in a different place. And he's saying, when, you're, when your soul leaves your body, and this is what he says, when it leaves your body and it's floating over your body, it hasn't gone anywhere. It's just like that moment you died, you're going to look back at this world and say, all those challenges were easy. Everything that seemed hard was easy. Now we can have a little pchina, a little aspect of that. We can think back to high school. At, at, the, at the age that we're at now, nobody here just graduated high school. And I mean, maybe Pesha Racha, I don't know. <laughs> um, and, and we say, wow, you know that teacher that gave me a hard time? That's like a joke now. Or this girl that I was scared to ask out, doesn't bother me anymore. Whatever challenges there were, what people thought about you, what you thought about yourself, that's like a joke. Or go back to kindergarten, it's even bigger a joke. And so he says, that's this world. But he says, if you can have that perspective while you're still in the body, then you could face the challenges and, not, and, and, and be on a level that they're not really challenges. And the only way to really reach that place is to be connected to Hashem, is to have the straightness of the heart. The straightness of the heart means we're taking all of the psychology and the logic and nature and science and we're pushing it aside, and we're just connecting to Hashem on an emuna level, on a faith level. V'chol ritzono ye la'asot od mitzvah. And all a person wants is just to do another mitzvah. Ta'ainu. That is to say, la'asot od et ratzon ha'kadosh baruch hu. To do more of what Hashem wants. V'yal yedei ha'simchan, through joy, yachad harim yiraneinu. Together, the mountains will rejoice. Rina u'lashon tfila. And of course, when we talk about rina, which is a word for joy, it's specifically talking about joy and davening, as it's written in Sefer Malachim, <coughs> to hear the rina, and which means to hear the davening. And we say that, of course, lishma el rina ve'atfila in the davening on Rosh Hashanah. We know that Rina is connected to davening. Harim, heim b'chinat tzadikim. And the mountains are the tzadikim. It's explained in Midrash. Migdal al haharim. I guess a tower on top of the mountains. Ein harim el avot. And who are we talking about? We're talking about our forefathers. We're talking about the people that came before us. That were, more, that were on a, a higher spiritual level. That is through the joy of the heart that through that um, the tzaddikim she'al yada yodim ha-tzaddikim through that the tzaddikim that are davening b'koach in a forceful way. So what is the thing of the tzaddikim? We had a whole section about the tzaddikim that were arguing with one another. And you might look at the arguments between the tzaddikim and think, oh, it's a real argument. Like the example I gave of the, the Gra, the Vilna Gaon, and the Alter Rebbe, who it would seem on the surface were, in a sense, arch enemies. Of course, they weren't. This is, Rabbi Nachman explains, this is covering up. This is an, they, their arguments are creating a way to block the negative energy in the world for our davening to be able to get through. Somebody who thinks that they're really enemies, they got it wrong. Somebody who, who knows that their arguments are the, for the sake of heaven and really for our sake, then that's what he's calling um, back here. Where is it? Harim. Um, I just said it before. Together, basically the tzaddikim, yiraneinu, is they're making noise, but they're really rejoicing. They're really creating a way for us to connect with Hashem. 
Now, okay, he's going to explain this here. Shal Yida Yodim at Sadikim and Mitpalim Koach Im Gzar Im Nigzar Kfar Hadin Olo. If there's been a judgment in heaven or not, Hey Mechonim Mitpalen Ula Albish at Filat. תפילתן במאמר שהוא דיבור שאינו שייך בפירוש לעניין בקשתם של ביטול הגזירה. So we learned that if you dive for a person and you feel a certain level of joy, you know that there hasn't been a judgment against them. But if you feel like there's some blockage, most likely there's been a judgment in heaven. Now the tzaddikim can truly know this. And so what do they do instead of davening directly? They daven in a roundabout way, which I gave lots of examples for. Um, a roundabout way would be, so I'll give uh, Noach an example that I gave, I had, apparently I had corona uh, a few, like a month or so ago, I still have a tiny cough left over for it, whatever I had, I had flu or something serious, and, um, but I, I didn't, we didn't have one Shabbos where we didn't have guests, and so I got sick on Shabbos, and then I was waiting for the next Shabbos, and I didn't even realize I was sick, it's crazy, but I said to Hashem, I'm inviting guests on Sunday, so that you'll have to make sure that I'm healthy on Shabbos to host the guests. And that was the roundabout way of davening for something. I couldn't just say, Hashem, heal me, Hashem, heal me, Hashem, heal me. I took an action that it actually worked. I mean, it wasn't such an easy Shabbos. The davening wasn't so easy, but it worked. So that's davening a roundabout way. That's because the judgment was already given. So the tzaddikim already know this, and they know to give davening in a roundabout way. Kirit palem b'perush, b'perush yav shau. You can't daven directly after the judgment is given. You have to do it in a roundabout way. As mentioned above, and this is what I want to say before. That what is this thing about the argument with the tzaddikim and the tzaddikim davening bekoach with this extra energy? It's because it, it's like you can't da- you can't just daven for something and it happens. You can't just say Hashem. Right now, I need $10,000, so please put it in my account. And then you see, bing, you just got $10,000. That would defeat the whole purpose of the world, because the whole purpose of the world is to be challenged and to have choices. And if everything came to you, you wouldn't be challenged. I mean, you could just take a person that grows up in a very wealthy home, and their parents are like, whenever the card gets to $25,000, well, it'll automatically be covered. So you go out with your friends, and like, buy whatever you want. They buy... $25,000, and the next morning it's covered. What a miserable life. You know, if you would think it'd be great. God, let me have that life. But at a certain point, that life is going to get very boring because it takes away the challenge. Even though the challenges are hard, that's what makes life meaningful. As long as you can overcome them. Sometimes the challenges break people, but for the most part, people are able to overcome them. And so Hashem... Um, gives Rashut, gives permission to the Malachi small, to the left wing angels. But it really means there's the small and Yamin. <laughs> it doesn't mean the left wingers. Um, small Docha Yamin Mekarevit. So that, that's what we have that this, the left hand pushes away while the right hand brings it forward. So we're talking about the angels from the left because the left is Gavura, the left is this pushing back energy. And so that's how he describes it, that how do, how do our challenges matter? Because Hashem allows the energy, the negative energy, to block your davening. He says here, to prosecute against you and to make masach. Masach is a screen, means literally a screen, like blocking. Imagine a mosquito screen that's blocking your davening. It's blocking, not getting up there. So your davening can't go up to heaven. And so, when a person understands the judgment has already been passed, so you have to now enclose the davening in a story or an explanation, like what I said. And this is the meaning of yachad together, shemal bishim tefilatam besipurim yachad. That the, the, the tzaddikim are enclosing their davening in stories together. Perush, the meaning is, ki atfila, hi b'chinat kol haba me'ayira, the sound that comes out from the fear of heaven, the b'chinat gvua, that comes from a place of self-discipline, stringency, 
אולם המאמרים והסיפורים הם דברים נעימים, even though when a person tells a story or says a nice little word, it's, um, it's a pleasant thing, שהם מבחינת חסד, and that's from the side of חסד, kindness. וצריך לחבר את היראה עם האהבה, so we have to bring together the awe and the fear with love, שזה מבחינת חיבור. הלבשת התפילה בסיפורים ובמאמרים. This is the connection between davening and the stories or the other, the roundabout way of davening. Bring them both together. כי מכיוון שהצדיק ראה שהוא אחר גזר דין, because the tzaddik saw that this person was already after a judgment, שאז אי אפשר להתפלל כי אם בהלבשה, you can't daven in, in a direct way, but rather in a roundabout way, מכימת קידוק ומהלכי השמאל. Because of the blockage that Hashem is creating in heaven, you can't just daven from like a really stringent way. Like a person can say, Hashem help me, Hashem help me, Hashem help me, Hashem help me, Hashem help me. It won't help you. Because it's being blocked, you're going to have to daven in a roundabout way. And therefore, it's And so a person has to, to daven in a way of a voice that comes from the line of Chokhmah, this we, we went into very deeply with uh, Matzah and Chametz, and the, the meaning of Matzah, the difference between the Chet and the Hey, that the difference between the two letters is that the Hey has the Kane, has a little line, and the Chet has a, is connected. Haba me'amoch mebchinat chasadim, that comes from the, the mind, which is connected to Chesed. Shuzah bechinat sipur v'ma'amau, this is connected to the story, and the other, roundabout way of speaking, then you bring together the kindness and the stringency already from the, your voice and your neck. And this is the yachad that we're talking about to bring together. By bringing together the story and the davening together. Okay, so there was a lot here. But that's the summary of the lesson. I'm sure Noach got a little something out of it at least. Was that the Shem? Arya now can sleep at night because the suspense is over and, and Yael and whoever else is still with us. Uh, I have a right she could do with fewer challenges. I've already told the story a hundred times that uh, you know, when you get to Olam Ba, the troubles and afflictions are counted as mitzvot. So... Uh, it's not easy now. I mean, the ultimate level is to be joyous in your troubles and afflictions now and not to have to wait for the world to come. So that's avoda. That's a lot of work to like really... I mean, one thing you can do, this is like practical advice for uh, Zahava <coughs> and for myself as well. One thing that you can do, Rav Arush talks about this in the Garden of Amuna is dance and say, thank you, Hashem, for my troubles and afflictions. Thank you, Hashem, for my overdraft. Thank you, Hashem, for my marital problems. Thank you, Hashem, for not giving me children yet. You know, whatever it is that a person is having, and to actually put your arms up and dance up and down and say, thank you, Hashem, for not giving me enough money to make it to the end of the month. Thank you, Hashem, for giving me Corona. The first time I had Corona, I was, I was in bed for four days, and I was literally like, thank you, Hashem, for giving me Corona, because I just wanted to get it over with. <laughs> um, so that you can do. I mean, you can rejoice in your troubles and afflictions to be on the level that you're really grateful for them while they're happening. That's a very high level. I, I don't know. I guess it's a rebel, level, level of Reb Zusha. I'm certainly not there yet. Um, but it's something to work towards. There's not a shame. Okay, so we're going to start a new lesson, and I think we're just going to get through the first page tonight. So this is, as I said, Chaf um, 24, Torah Chaf and it talks about where is the center of the universe. But of course, we don't just stay there. That's just the opening in order for Rabbi Nachman to give us deeper lessons in, um, in thriving in this world. Um, and I don't know if I'm saying this right, Savi Davi Atuna. So this is in the Gemara 
in Masechet Bechorot, in the sugiya, in the question about the elders of Atuna, of Athens. So I did look it up. Um, it's from page 8b. And there, the elders of Athens are asking all of these questions, like, why do you add salt to water? How long does it take for a snake to gestate? I don't know, crazy questions like that. I didn't go to, I didn't have a yeshiva education, so I never sat down and like went through the whole Gemara or whatever. I have learned different Masechtot, but this I wasn't familiar with. And so one of the questions, it says here in the notes that um, this is the second of two lessons that Rabbi Nachman gives, giving the deeper meaning behind the questions that were asked to Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananiah. So Amule, the, they said to him, Zikne Atuna, the Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananiah, the elders of Athens to Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananiah, um, Hechan hu etzba haolam. It's written in Aramaic, which, uh, uh, what is it? Em tsauta de alma hecha. Where is the finger or the middle of the universe? Um, Zakaf et etzbotav. So he raised up his finger. This is Rabbi Yeshua ben Hanania. Amau, and he said to them, Amau lehem, kan hu emtza haolam. This is the middle of the world. So right here, that's the middle of the world. Got it, Ari? Everyone right here in the middle of the screen. This is the middle of the world. If you're ever looking for it, here it is. Amau lei kan hu emtza haolam. Amu lei mi Mi Yemar, and they said to him, Who says that here, Mi, mi Yomar, Shekan Em Olam, who says that this is the middle of the world? Um, Amar, he said, Tavil Chavalim Vitit Modedu. <coughs> Bring some ropes and measure it out. And this Torah, so that's what we're starting off with. That's the Sukiya that we're starting off with. That from there, Rabbi Nachman's going to give us deeper um, understandings. Lashon Obeinu, Zichon Obecha. And so when it says, Lashon Rabbeinu Zichonon Vecha, it means that Rabbi Nachman gave it this over word for word. Either he, I mean, here it says that this was given on a Shabbos in Breslov. So apparently this was like memorized by a group of people that had photographic memories. And then afterwards they compared their notes. And, but so many of the lessons in the Kutay Moran were lessons that Rabbi Nassim heard and then summarized them afterwards and went back to Rabbi Nachman and said, did I do a good job? And he corrected here and there. Or he heard it from the other Hasidim. There's a few of them. Most of them, he was present for them. And he wrote it down, then went back to Rabbi Nachman. So everything here has been edited by Rabbi Nachman. Also, by the way, the Lubavitcher Rebbe's, I know at least the last Lubavitcher Rebbe, you know, he had his chosrim, he had his people with um, photographic memories, and afterwards they would all write down the things that the Rebbe said on Shabbos, and then they would compare notes, and then they would bring the notes to the Rebbe, and the Rebbe would make corrections. So that was the method for doing this stuff. First, he's going to explain the deep level of this Torah. And that's, there, is, there is an infinite light. And if a person merits to have their mind follow after this concept and try to understand it, mate. A person can reach the level of reaching but not reaching. Aleph Da Shiyesh O should know that there is a light. Shahula Mala Me Shiyesh O Makif that there's there's a light that's a surrounding light. Shu Gavoa me nefesh ruach venashama shala adam. That is above the soul, the spirit, and and I don't know how we're, we're translating nefesh ruach and neshama. How are you translating that? Are you? Soul, spirit, uh, something. And life force. Life force of a person. So it's beyond, it's beyond anything that you could reach. Now, what does he mean by that? In my mind, I can reach amazing things. Like I can imagine anything. Anything that I can imagine. And <clears throat> um, 
So my mind can go very far, but it can't go as far as the Oran Sof. It can't go as far as this makif, the surrounding light. Shvehu o in sof. This is the infinite light. O hanikra in sof. It's called infinite. She'ein lanu bo shum asaga. Why is it infinite? Because it's infinitely beyond us. Kiu gavor me'al ha'olamot ha'elionim. It's above even the highest worlds. Atzilut bria yitzira va'asiya. Shemehem nimshachim anefesh. Through these higher worlds, that's where the soul comes down. So now we've talked about the worlds before, and what does it mean? This world is Olam Asiya. This is the lowest of all the worlds. And this is, in a sense, the darkest. So I'm saying, in quotes, the darkest of all the worlds. It's not a dark world, obviously. There's plenty of light in this world, not just physical light, but spiritual light and human light. <coughs> but this is the world where Hashem is most hidden. A person can live their whole life and say, I don't believe in God, and God will still continue to send them parnasa, health, and make their heart beat, and give them children, and give them everything. And the person is allowed to deny God's existence and still live. Once you get into the higher worlds, it's a higher revealed light of Hashem, and your free will disappears. You no longer can say that there's no God. So there are people that have had, you know, um, near-death experiences, and they went to heaven. They saw their ancestors, and they were judged. There's all kinds of stories of people that went through this. And these people believe it 100%. If you go to them, you say, there's no God. Like, are you kidding me? You know where I've been? I I've seen it. There's God. So that's a higher level. Like that, Their consciousness is, in a sense, on a higher level, and in a sense, they lost a bit of free will, because... A person that, like, I remember seeing a video in Hebrew of some guy who had a near-death experience, and he became Haredi afterwards, and he's like, I saw myself burning in hell. I just want to be the most religious Jew I can possibly be. So that's wonderful that you want to be the most religious Jew you can possibly be, but you're not doing it out of free will. You're doing it out of absolute fear because you saw yourself burning in hell. But if I didn't see myself burning in hell, and I still want to be the most religious Jew I can be, Ah, then I've done it under free will. And that's a different level. That's a higher level. So the soul comes down through these higher spiritual levels. And the, the Ein Sof is another word for Hashem. She'ein lo tchila v'sof. Doesn't have a beginning and doesn't have an end. And by the way, our lives also don't have a beginning and they, do, they also don't have an end. Because from the moment that two cells come together, the body begins, but at a certain point, the soul comes into the body. The soul was in, existed before it came into the body, and the soul exists when it leaves the body. So really, our life here is only the middle. It's not the beginning and it's not the end. And even though your intellect is not capable of grasping this high level of Hashem's existence, Afan Pichen Redifa de Machshava de Miodaf. I'm reading in Arabic now. A Machshava de Rodefet la Sigoto, even though if your mind is trying to grasp it, Alide ha Redifa, through this trying to grasp it, as a Sechel Masigoto, the Pchinat Mate, below Mate. Then the intellect, your mind, grasp it in the sense of Magia, below Magia. It reaches, but it doesn't reach. Um, it would be like an optical illusion. You know, it, I look at this and I feel like I can reach it. But when I reach it, it's not actually there. So I reached it, but it's not there. We have a, a cat at home and we have a little red laser we put on the floor. And he chases after the laser and he catches it. And then he lifts up his paw and he's like, it's not there. <laughs> so that's in a sense, reaching it and not reaching it. That is, it reaches it, but doesn't reach it. As it's explained in the Zohar, relating to the parasha of Noach, Why can't we grasp this high level of Hashem's existence? Because it's beyond the physical and spiritual capacity that we have. 
בבחינות אלו שלמעלה מהנשמה נקראות אין סוף. And what is this? This is called the infinite, infinite light. ומה שמסיק ממנו הוא ההשגה לדעת מעט מגדלותו. What can we grasp? We can grasp understanding a tiny bit of Hashem's greatness. ומבין מדוע אינו יכול להשיגו. And a person can understand why they can't grasp this level. If you understand why you can't grasp the level, then you get a little bit of understanding of the level. So he says here, כמבואר, as it's going to be explained above, שתכלית הידיעה שלא תדע. What is the highest level of knowing? It's that you don't know. לבחינת מטה ולא מטה. An aspect of, of reaching and not reaching, שהיא השגה גדולה ונפלאה. This is a great and wondrous level of understanding. להשיג ולא להשיג כאחד. To grasp and not to grasp at the same time. וזה פועם קדושה באדם, and this activates holiness within a person. So he has a, a little piece here on Amuna. I'm going to read this quickly, tell the story, and then we're done. Okay, it's written in Likutei Alachot. Ikar hu ha-amuna. The main thing is Amuna. Trust and belief in Hashem. Ve-amuna hi hathala, ve-apetach, ve-ashar lichnos ba-avodat Hashem. Ve-asagat elokut. First, you have to have Amuna in order to be able to serve Hashem and to grasp Hashem in any way whatsoever. Shia sofa tachlit shed kol ha-yidiyot ve-asagot v'bchinat tachlit ha-yidiyah You know what, I want to read this next week because I don't want to read it so fast. So I'm going to save that for next week and we'll start there next week. But what he's saying is that and the only way that you can get anywhere in service of Hashem is having a muna because there are going to be so many things that you can't understand. Now, I love when I meet um, secular people who tell me, I can't believe in God. I'm not, a, I'm not an idiot. What do you think, I'm in kindergarten? I'm going to believe in some old man sitting on a cloud with a big white beard? And I say, what are you making fun of me? <laughs> making fun of white beards? Don't, really, don't do that. So I, I asked them, do you know how the medication you take works? They're like, no. So, so why do you take it? Because I believe that it's going to work. So you believe in medication, but you don't believe in God? This is just a stupid pill. You don't believe in, what, in the force that's running the whole universe? Can you explain everything that's happening? No. But, so how do you know it's going to happen? When you take a, a vaccine, how do you know it's going to help you? I believe in science. What is science? Science is, is really belief in Hashem. The science is saying, we know if we take this and we take this, it creates this. We don't know exactly why. But we know it does. So here, have it, and now you're vaccinated. Somewhere down the line, somebody had a level of belief and put it in a package, and then you believed it. So there is belief. It's just, that's what Rabbi Nachman calls, like, hastara betoch hastara, that there's hiddenness and type of hiddenness. That's why this world is the darkest of all places. It's not that it's dark. It's that Hashem is hidden, and He's hidden on purpose in order for us to find Him. Okay, so this is a really short story. Since we only have like one minute, I think it'll take a minute to tell the story. I may have told the story before, Rabbi Shmuel, Abba of Zichnin, um, Purim was like a big holiday for him. He'd come into the holiday with a great deal of joy. And anyone who didn't treat the day properly and didn't dress in Shabbos clothes to honor the day, he got upset at them. So I always have a costume on, on, Shab- on, on Purim, but I wear my Shabbos clothes underneath the costume. The custom is chitzon yut, but it's a yom tov, and you have to treat it as a yom tov. In one year, the base midrash was filled with all of the local Jews. They'd all come to hear the Megillah, and they're all dressed in their best Shabbos clothes, except for one guy who showed up in his weekday clothes. And the Hasidim said to him, what are you doing? The Rebbe makes such a big deal about wearing Shabbos clothes on Purim. And I don't know how you say it in Yiddish, but he says Purim is not a yom tov, and uh, fever is not a sickness. I know kadachat is no, not iznit machla, whatever, however they say it. I have a Yiddish speaking shul, but they, they tell me everything in Hebrew. <laughs> um, so this guy says, Purim is not a yom tov, and a fever is not a sickness. And at that moment, Reb Shmuel Abba looks at this guy, and he said, Purim is a yom tov, and a fever is a sickness. And when that guy went home that night, he had 
little fever. I said, this is where I'm gonna lay down, got a little fever. The next day the fever got worse and worse and worse. And it kept going for days. And then he sent a message to the tzaddik asking for a bracha. And the tzaddik sent back a message. Now he knows that a fever is really a sickness and that Purim is really a yam tov. And he apparently suffered this fever the whole year. Showed up the next year in his best Shabbos clothes and told everybody, now I understand that Purim is a yam tov. So with all the craziness, and you know, they put letters around the neighborhood here. Don't have your cars on Nisim Bachar. Don't expect there to be guards blocking your house and on the roads and everything. With all of that, remember that Purim is a Yom Tov. And Be'ezat Hashem, we should merit to reach the highest places. Wow. So we won't be meeting again until after Purim. So we won't be the same people. It's going to be a life-changing experience, Be'ezat Hashem. Mm-hmm. So we'll sing the Purim. Uh,